from Department of Mechanical Engineering, second year. I warmly welcome you all for one day webinar on electric and hybrid vehicles conducted by SAE OU. Today, our speaker, Mr. Nishant Govardhan, sir, is here to share his knowledge with us. Mr. Nishant is an automobile engineer and currently working as an engineer at SRM Nikki Auto Systems in ECU calibration and testing. He is passionate about anything that has auto in it and is skilled in product strategy and planning. He is graduated from SRM Institute of Science and Technology and is an IASSC certified Lean Six Sigma Black Belt and has done process excellence projects in supply chain production finance at Ashok Leland. He is also ASDC certified automotive level five technician and is devoted to DIY, do it yourself ideology when it comes to maintaining his vehicles. Nishant is an a management committee member of SAE India Southern Session Mahindra World City Division and strives to bring a positive change to the society. We will we welcome you, sir. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for that warm welcome as well. Okay. And uh, we are also honored to have Mr. V. Uma Maheshwar sir with us who is faculty advisor of SAE Collegiate Club. V. Uma Maheshwar sir is a faculty of mechanical department, teaches us thermal engineering. He has completed his BE in mechanical, ME and turbo machines and PhD from UCOU. Sir has delivered guest talks at the Hindu, Inadu, Sakshi and Namaste Telangana, education counseling fairs for many years on mechanical engineering and placement scenarios in engineering. Sir has also published many general and conference papers. He also initiated and organized two international conferences and one national conference. Apart from organizing many international and national conferences, seminars, workshops, and training programs at Usmania University. And Sir was a founder of MEGA, Mechanical Engineering Graduates Alumni Student Association of Usmania University in 2000. 2000. He was also vice chairperson for SAE India Hyderabad division. Sir has been with us right from the inception of the club and in fact he is the reason for the birth and continuation of this club. Sir believes in supporting students, always lets hand of help even at low cost of his own, own comforts. He also taken n number of risks for bringing new opportunities to students of the college. We thank you for, for present here today. Hey, I don't have expected that you talk about me. Uh, Good afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, Nishant Goedrazan, sir. I think it's uh, pleasant to see you here. You must have met earlier in some SAE meetings. Uh, I'm also EB member, Indian Education Board member, presently the vice chair for the SA Hyderabad division for student activities. Very nice to see you here. Uh, students are very delighted to, yeah, very, very thankful to you. The students are very delighted to have a session with you. Looking forward to your uh, good uh, uh, delivery of information and uh, knowledge that is, it will be passed on to students. Welcome, sir. Now let's head to the session. Today we will be discussing about hybrid vehicles, the current trends, a comprehensive overview of hybrid vehicles, and how, as engineering students, we need to aware of these diverse arenas of technolo technological application. Without further ado, I hand over the session to Mr. Nishant. Welcome, sir. The session is all yours. Uh, good evening, one and all. Thank you very much. Uh, just before I start, I would like to know whether my uh, audio is audible. Is there any yes, issue? Yes, you are audible. No, sir, okay. there is no issue. Right. When I start sharing my screen, I switch off the video, so there is no interruption. Okay, sir. So once again, thank you very much, one and all, for this amazing opportunity. Especially, I would like to thank the SAE chairwoman and also Mr. Shashank, who I met in uh, the student convention tier three event as a judge, and he was a great organizer as well for that event. So thank you. I also thank you for the thank you, Mr. Kesh, for the very warm welcome, and thank you, Dr. Uma Maheshwar sir, for the welcome as well. So without further ado, let's go into the session. I'll uh, share my screen now. Yeah, I just want to check, is my screen visible? Yes, sir. OK, great. Let's start. So uh, very good evening to one and all again. So we will have a talk on electric and hybrid vehicles. 
a confident level overview. So a small intro about myself. I am Nishant Govindarajan, an engineer at SRM Nikki Auto Systems. Uh, we are a joint venture company between SRM Technologies, who is into a lot of embedded systems technology, uh, and Nikki Carburetors Limited of Japan, who was one of the pioneers of the carburetor technology in Japan. And now we are currently into electronic control units for fuel injection systems using model-based development and also electric vehicle motors. So this will be uh, the short agenda for the session. I would like to talk for around 40 minutes, and then we could have a nice uh, question and answer session, more interaction. So we would first talk on the disruptions in the automotive industry, which are happening and are yet to happen, which will ultimately happen in a couple of years. What are the emerging trends? Uh, and obviously hybrid and electric vehicles. The classification of hybrid vehicles based on the architecture. The classification of hybrid vehicles based on the level to which they are hybridized. Uh, the overview of components in both vehicles. And the main power source, the battery, the types of the battery and the driver, the types of the motors. Plus, ultimately, we'll have to charge our vehicle, so we will have a small overview on the charging the equipment. And as I said, we'll go to the question and answer. So let's go on to the first slide. So you might have heard this jargon floating around in every other conference and uh, you know lecture you might have attended. Case. So what is case? C. It's an acronym. Acronym. And C starts stands for connected. A. Autonomous. S. Shared and electric. So how are connected, autonomous, shared, and electric cars the future? And why are they called disruptors? So you might have heard of, say, the Kia Sonnet or the MG Hector with its connected car technology. I would say that that is more of a marketing gimmick, even though you have small you know, features which help out in your, uh, in your commute. A real connected car is a car which can talk to other cars via the internet and help out in traffic management or help you to go to your destination safer, faster, and also more efficiently. So suppose you're in your car and you want to you know, go for a coffee. You just say, hey car, please take me to a coffee shop. So since it's connected to the web, it will search for the coffee shops, nearest coffee shops in the area. It will obviously be connected to Google, so you will know the ratings. And it might take you to your preferred coffee shop. You will obviously have to input either the best or the closest. Then it will take you to the coffee shop. So now, it first will plot its way to the coffee shop from the current location. If it's an electric car, it will tell you how much charge is left. And it will also calculate whether that particular battery percentage is enough for you to reach that coffee shop and then come back home. Or it will search for a charging point or a charging station if you have to continue your journey afterwards. If the coffee shop is so advanced that it already has charging infrastructure built into the coffee shop, it will also book a slot for the charging while you reach. And it will charge itself. And if it's a DC or an AC fast charger, it will automatically choose depending upon your next uh, point in your journey. Now, we have transitioned into what is called as mobility as a service, wherein we use cars not only for you know uh, transportation or earlier earlier in those days it was you know a status symbol. Now it is no longer a luxury; it is a necessity. It merely takes you from point A to point B. So why do you have to do the driving? You can might as well have somebody else do the driving, wherein you have a shared mobility option, or if you are so brave enough to let the car drive itself, you can choose an autonomous car which can take you to your location, and you can have your own meeting in your car, or if you are a student, you can finish your you know, exams or assignments on your way to college or work. So it is hailing a ride is as simple as whipping out your phone, saying, I'm here, 
uh, sent a car to my location, a car automatically, since it's connected to the web, and that data is being sent to uh, you know, a data center, it can tell you where all the cars are, where you are, and you can, a car can come to you. But one most important thing of all this is cybersecurity, which is why you're supposed to have proper, robust uh, blockchain technologies and uh, lots of redundancies in place. So suppose what your first level of security fails, you will have so many other you know, redundancies in place so that uh, information will not be you know, uh, transparent and available to hackers that easily. Well, everybody must be familiar with this red car, which is at the bottom of our screen. Yes, it is a Tesla. It is, I think, a Model X. So Tesla are the pioneers in the electric vehicle industry, especially passenger cars. And it all comes down to their battery and their motor. So we will go further into what this is, why we go into the types of the battery. So these are the main disruptors which are happening and are yet to happen. Let's move on. Emerging trends. There are four main emerging trends which obviously are built into the car and despite whatever car it's whatever propels the car either an IC engine or an electric vehicle, you will have this. First is being industry 4.0 wherein how the you know uh, cars are being built and the services are being provided. Next is Internet of Things, machine learning, and of course, artificial intelligence. So a few key lessons from what the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us. Nishanji, please make it full screen, small suggestion. Your presentation. Uh, for me, it's showing as full screen. So. OK, OK. Please go ahead. I'll come out and come back in. Now is it fine, sir? Yeah, please go ahead, sir. OK, great. So I think we were, yeah. So what are the key lessons that the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us? If there are no humans, the factories won't run, even though whatever level of automation you have. And then, yes, I do mean automation. Because you still need somebody to you know, press the machine's button saying start, and the machine starts, or the entire process starts, and your uh, cycle eventually starts. So what does Industry 4.0 say? Industry 4.0 has you know, smart robots and smart factories which talk to each other. Suppose you have a huge assembly line starting from casting, which ends in painting. You have casting, machining, uh, inspection, painting, finally dispatch. Suppose there is uh, industry 4.0 implemented into this assembly line. All the machines will frequently keep talking to each other, seeing ways how to improve their cycle times, and always hitting their cycle time targets. So let's say there is some issue in machine number five in the machining section. So since all the machines are connected, the machines in paint, dispatch, casting, and the furnace, obviously, furnace and casting will know that there is an issue in the middle of the line. So what will they do? They will stop. And until that problem is fixed, they will not start. Because you keep producing the machine, uh, the, suppose you're producing wheels. You keep producing the wheels up to machining. You will have a bottleneck in casting, and you it cannot proceed further. So you can prevent accidents in this. And it's not only you know, a small scenario like this. You can have huge plants running all by themselves with no workers in sight. But ultimately, humans are required for, you know, maintenance of the machines and, and designing, you know, the entire uh, layout of the plant. And obviously, when the robots, uh, you know, break down, humans only have to go and fix them. They can't fix themselves. Or maybe we'll come up with Industry 5.0 where the robots do everything by themselves also. Uh, right, IoT, machine learning, and artificial intelligence are very much required for 
the previous slides, connected cars, shared, autonomous to come into the picture. Suppose you want to go to, say, a place, you have to have your car connected, car or vehicle connected to the internet, and it should be a smart device. And the signal at the shop also should be connected to the internet. I think most of you would have heard about Google Home and its services. Right, machine learning also, as the picture clearly says, through various algorithms, you teach a machine to give it, give it an input saying, this is a car. How do you say it is a car? Is it weather? Is it time? Is it hungry? Is it a bus? Uh, you go through each and every um, you know, step of the algorithm, true, false, true, false, true, false. Finally, you can come up to the notion that is whether it is a car or not a car. Once the machine learns that it is a car, the opportunities are endless. You can even teach it to you know, uh, get processes done by itself. So let's move on to the main topic of the day, hybrid and electric vehicles. So this car must be very, very familiar to all of you. It's the Toyota Prius. And Toyota's hybrid technology is world famous. And now they're moving on to hydrogen fuel cells. And this, you know, an Indian innovation, it's a really, really proud moment for you know, Indian OEMs and auto manufacturers wherein we can produce an electric car by ourselves. Uh, this is obviously the Tata Nexon EV. So let's talk about, you know, let's dive deep into uh, what makes them who they are. So the hybrid vehicle is powered by an electric motor or an internal combustion engine, which is why I put ICE. And you don't get a tax rebate when you purchase and uh, purchase a hybrid car, at least in India. If, uh, the unfortunate part of the thing is, if your car has both a motor and an IC engine, you'll have to pay extra tax. Whereas in the European Union, it's not so, which is why mild hybrid technology has been mandated. So we'll come come into what is what constitutes as a mild hybrid, mild hybrid later. So the range is obviously more than an internal combustion engine. Thanks to the motor, the engine shuts off when the car is coasting. And obviously, since you have a battery pack and a motor, it is more expensive than a traditional petrol or a diesel vehicle. Now let's move on to the electric vehicle. Obviously, it is powered by an electric motor. You do get tax rebates, especially, I think, Telangana, uh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Delhi are one of the first few states to offer 100% free road tax. It's not for the personal vehicle, but it is at least for you know shared mobility for a EV taxi and also for lead acid based uh, two wheelers. Now, yes, there is a range anxiety problem. The range, the amount of you know distance you can go with the electric vehicle on one single charge is lower than a petrol or a diesel vehicle. But then Frequent charging along your journey helps, and since DC chargers are becoming better and better every day, we will come to a point wherein it will take the same amount of time that you take to fill in petrol fully in your petrol tank. It will take the same amount of time to charge your full battery within, say, 10 minutes. Yes, it is more expensive than an internal combustion engine and a hybrid vehicle because of the high import duties for uh, the battery packs. Battery packs, unfortunately, are not, uh, batteries, unfortunately, are not manufactured in India. Battery packs are starting to be manufactured in India, but not on a large scale. Motors can be manufactured in India, and also the control unit is also manufactured in India. So the battery alone takes up 50% of the cost of the vehicle. Suppose the, I think the next one is around 20 lakhs. Seven to eight lakhs will be the price of the battery. And you have to keep changing it every five years. So what is the ultimate result? The hybrids are an immediate solution to environmental protection. And the EVs are a long-term solution. But with a disclaimer. Why the disclaimer? Fuel cell based EVs are the long term solution, hydrogen fuel cells. But then again, just like you don't have 
you know, an electric vehicle charging station. You don't have a hydrogen filling station. So only after that infrastructure builds up, will your fuel cell EV, uh, you know, be of a lesser harm to the environment than a diesel car. Let's move on. Right. Now, we've come to the hybrids based on the architecture. What are the hybrids based on architecture? First, you have a series hybrid. So what does a series hybrid do? Uh, as you, I, I hope all of you can see my mouse, mouse pointer. So here is the IC engine. What is an IC engine powered by? It's powered by petrol or diesel. Then that we see IC engine is connected to a generator which converts your know, mechanical energy to electrical energy. Then it goes on to a power converter, obviously, AC to DC. Then it charges your battery. Now, from the battery, the battery powers the electric motor. And then finally, the electric motor goes to the rear wheels or the front wheels. Or if it is a high power vehicle, it needs a transmission. It goes to the transmission and then to the wheels. A series hybrid architecture is very simple. An engine powering the battery, battery powering the motor. The motor drives the car. It's as simple as that. Next. Is this, this is a parallel hybrid. At times, when you want to use the IC engine, you can use the IC engine. And at other times, when you want to use the electric motor, you can use the electric motor. So again, IC engine powered by petrol or diesel goes to a coupler in the transmission. The battery powered by electricity, goes to a power converter, which powers the electric motor, goes to a coupler, transmission, then the wheel. So this provides more flexibility, but uh, you have to be careful about this mechanical coupler. And that's about it. Next architecture is a series parallel hybrid. Right. This is where things start, start getting complex. You have the IC engine fueled by petrol or diesel, which goes to a mechanical coupler, then to the transmission. Or you have the IC engine powering the generator, which goes to the power converter, which goes to the battery, which powers the electric motor, and then the transmission. Or you can bypass the engine, battery, power converter, electric motor, transmission. So there are a lot more modes of operation. You can have the engine stand alone driving the car, or you can have the battery stand alone driving the car, or you can have the engine driving the car as well as charging the battery, which provides assistance in slow speed. Now, this is a very, very complex uh, you know, schematic. As the name rightly says, it's a complex hybrid. So I'll just give you a minute to you know, absorb all this. You have your IC engine, the fuel tank, the coupler straight to the transmission, or the generator, power converter, battery, again, power converter, motor, transmission. So this is a very complex sort of layout, which is not really used, but it exists, which is similar to the series parallel hybrid. But it is not used due to the sheer complexity. That's all. And it's too many parts to you know, put into the car and as well as think of the passengers who sit in the car with, you know, uh, foot space and headroom and like, I think we can move on. Right. Hybrids based on the level of hybridization. Like, I, you must have heard micro hybrid, you know, mild hybrid, strong hybrid, full hybrid. Let's see what exactly these are. A few major classifications you have micro hybrids which have an integrated starter generator plus a start stop system next you have an integrated starter generator hybrid next you have a mild hybrid and then finally a full hybrid so i've just put in a few pictures of indian cars that you can you know easily understand so a micro hybrid with just a start stop system with the same lead acid battery, which just helps you in switching off the car and switching it on at traffic lights, has already been introduced in the 
Mahindra Scorpio, which has already been there for a long, long time, and it, it badly needs the facelift. So what does this car do? What does a start-stop system mean? So when you stop, when the car comes to a stop at a set of traffic lights, and the car is in neutral, and the start-stop system is switched on by the driver, the car automatically stops, thereby saving fuel by not running idling at the traffic stop. Then when you press the clutch when the signal turns green, the car immediately starts and you go on with your journey. It's as simple as that. You have a traditional engine. The electric motor is belt driven, like your starter motor. Uh, the power, electric power that the motor generates is barely 2 to 5 kilowatts. Again, it's a standard 12 volt system. You have a minor improvement of 3 to 5 percentage in your fuel economy. Now, which Indian car has an ISG hybrid micro hybrid system? This is a Suzuki CS or any Maruti with the SHVS system, which you've seen. Initially, they introduced their diesel cars. Now, since the uh, uh, VS6 advent of VS6 has occurred, they have switched completely to petrol, and they are offering their SHVS system in petrol as well. So, what is the difference between the Scorpio mentioned here and the CRS mentioned here? This runs on a 12 to 42 volt system. It has a lithium-ion battery for you know start-stop, and as well as it providing boost. This is not too much. It provides a small amount of acceleration at low, low speeds. But again, the fuel economy improvement is only 5 to 10 percentage. Again, the operating voltage is 12 to 42 volts. Electric power is around 3 to 10 kilowatts. Now, the motor can be either on the belt or the crankshaft. You can also have regenerative braking which converts your kinetic energy uh, when you break to electric power. So let's move on to the mild hybrid. So this is a Mercedes M-Class. If you're not familiar with the M-Class, it's quite old. The M-Class has become the GLE. And any Mercedes blue tech you take in, that is, they are plug-in hybrids or mild hybrids. You have a very small range of say 20 to 30 kilometers in electric only range and obviously you have a downsized petrol engine so suppose you take this car as only an internal combustion engine you, it might have a 2000 cc engine or a maximum 2500 cc engine so since it's a mild hybrid it will have probably a 1.5 liter engine 1500 cc since it has an electric motor to cope when you're coasting or in you know in the city so it operates at a high voltage range of 60 to 200 volts you have pretty good fuel economy improvement and your electric motor is connected to the belt or the crankshaft now let's move on to a proper hybrid this is the toyota camry this is introduced in the electric uh, electric vehicle segment by toyota in india and it has a downsized engine. You have the electric motor connected to the crankshaft. And this is a typical series hybrid. You have the engine running on an Atkinson cycle, not the typical auto cycle. It runs on the Atkinson cycle. It charges you know, the batteries. The battery powers the motor, and the car moves. So this is a typical series hybrid layout. And it gives a fuel economy improvement over the standard Toyota Camry petrol up to 30 percentage but the operating voltage is, is quite high since it is a proper lithium-ion tank okay what constitutes a hybrid car a hybrid or an electric car let's see what components there are there so this is a typical electric car first you have the floor of the car filled with batteries uh, in, you have cells which make up modules, which make up a huge battery pack. Next, you have the controller, you have the battery management system, BMS, as you would have studied in your classes. You also have an inverter because you cannot use, say, 48 volt or 300 volt architecture for, say, your cabin lamps. So it will burn, it will not uh, take in. 
So you would need a converter to convert it from 300 volts to usable DC 12 volt voltage. That is why you have an inverter. Next, you have the motor, which actually drives the car. That's where the major amount of battery voltage goes on to. Next, you have the onboard charger of the vehicle, which charges the batteries. This charger is just a port, you could say. And you would have an external charger, which is connected to your grid at your house. And then you have a long cable, which comes up to the charging port of the car. It's similar to your smartphones. You have a charger connected to the outlet. You plug it into your phone, and it charges. And automatically, it switches off when it reaches 100 percent. But when your phone takes, uh, most Samsung's fast, fast chargers take around an hour and a half to charge around 4,000 milliamp hours. This would take for the size of car, say an Exxon EV, it would take around eight to nine hours to charge the entire car. That is from the regular outlet in your house. AC, AC fast charge, AC slow charge, I'm sorry, AC slow charge. Then for most cars, they do not require a transmission, but you might have one reduction gear, probably first. You might have one reduction gear, which is why you have a transmission. Then you would also have an auxiliary battery, which is which would not be lithium ion, which would be lead acid to control your, uh, again, as I said, lights, wipers, brake lamps, all those systems which require 12 volts, which operate on 12 volts. Like you have your radiator system which cools the engine, you have a radiator which cools the battery pack. And you would, might have seen Tesla's very nice cooling system, uh, which provides optimum cooling efficiency in all temperatures. And finally, again, you have DC DC converters, which help for you know auxiliary components. So with that being said, I think we can move to the battery types. Now, there are various battery chemistries to consider. All current cars, that is internal combustion engine cars, run on lead acid batteries, which are on the far end of the graph. Then you have nickel cadmium, then nickel metal hydride, then manganese lithium ion, then phosphate lithium ion, then cobalt lithium ion. You have varying energy densities. You have 40 for lead acid, and it goes up to you know 160 watt hours per kg for lithium ion. So which battery would be the optimum choice? It is obviously lithium ion. But what are the advantages? You have high energy per kg. It has a long cycle life. You have long charge and discharge cycles. You have deep discharge. You might have seen your phones even operating at 1% and 2% charge for, say, a longer time, which is, say, around 10, 15 minutes. That is what deep discharge means. They are highly efficient in storing and returning energy. They have fast charging capabilities. I would like to you know, ask you all to take an analogy with your smartphones, which is exactly how the car also charges. Which is why the fast charging of same of your smartphones also happens in your electric car. But you need specialized equipment called DC fast chargers, which are not available at your house, which cannot be installed at your house. You would need to connect it to directly to the grid, which is why there are only public DC fast chargers. So I am not very sure what the phone is, but it is some one plus seven or eight, which gives you around uh, I think 80% charge in 30 minutes or so. The DC fast chargers for say the Nexon can charge your uh, charge 80% of your battery in around 30 minutes. So if you plan your journey in such a way that you start from your house in the morning, you have to reach around 500 kilometers away. You can maybe stop for lunch, get your car charged in 30 minutes and be on your way. But that is at a DC fast charging station. Next, you also have a flat discharge curve. You have low self discharge. Suppose you're taking your car to your airport. Uh, it's not your airport, I'm sorry. Suppose you're taking your car to the airport and you're going on a trip which takes around three days. So you take your car, you park it at the airport, switch it off, you take, go on the flight, go do your stuff for three days, you come back. 
and you might notice that your 100 percentage battery is not at 100 percentage anymore it would be at 90 percentage so this 10 10 percentage is considered low that is self discharge so this low sort of self discharge is why lithium ion chemistry is cobalt lithium ion chemistry is preferred and it is also maintenance free same to your uh, analogous to your lead acid batteries wherein you need not check each and every cell whether the uh, distal water level is okay i think amaron provides maintenance free batteries the same way you have maintenance free batteries uh, for lithium ion it is non toxic and you do have you know second life of batteries wherein once your car reaches 5 years old the battery has to be replaced you can't that same battery pack cannot be used for a car anymore but you can use the same battery to power an inverter so which is why you have no disposal issues and you have a proper recycling you know uh, method now move on to how cells are shaped you have cylindrical cells as used in teslas you have prismatic cells which are made by panasonic and you have pouch cells which mostly you will find in your mobile phones but i think a uh, chevrolet bolt also uses these sort of batteries oh let's move on to the disadvantages and advantages the cylindrical cell has good mechanical stability none of the components are strunched together the prismatic cells have more stress on the corners of the pack since they are bunched together and the pouch cells have a robust and easy design so you have good packaging density cylindrical cells there's a lot of free space inside the cells the prismatic has good as high packaging density uh, for a matter of fact and the main issue with pouch cells is that they swell up so suppose you haven't used your phone for say 2 uh, 3 years and you just kept it at the bottom of your shelf you see, go see the battery after a few years it will be swollen up the same issue happens in a pouch cell so even when you're designing the space for you know a pouch cell you'll have to take into account the swelling which will happen which will eventually happen in a few years right coming back to thermal management it's very easy to manage your cylindrical cells prismatic have very difficult thermal management uh, problems and the pouch cells you must be very careful to place place them uh, far away from edges because if you have something sharp in your uh, suppose the bodywork of your car is too sharp it can lead to puncture of the cell and it is obviously a fire risk so where are they used cylindrical cells are used mostly in teslas almost every other ev uses a prismatic cell and pouch cells are limited to mobile phones but the earlier first gen chevrolet bolt ev obviously it's not sold in india uh used the pouch cell so i think with that we can move on to the main prime mover which is the motor right the types of motors you have basically five types of motors the most important ones are a permanent magnet synchronous motor a switched reluctance motor a brushless dc motor a regular old dc motor and induction motor now i would also like to give you this table which helps you understand easily so now how does the motor work if i could just get your attention to the brushless dc motor you have a stator permanent magnet permanent magnets with coils around them uh, this is your rotor in in, uh, in the middle and you have coils so this is one set you could say so when you charge you you should actually have another set here it has not been represented because it's a cross section so you have one coil here and there's another one here north south north south so when you energize this set of coils this would have north and this would have south so these would be attracted to the north south of the magnets so while it is attracted 
this will move this will rotate so when the south of this reaches here this these two coils will be de-energized and these two coils would be energized so again this becomes north so this will be repelled by the north and this will be attracted to the south so again once this goes this will also rotate so as and when you have coils energizing and de-energizing they move on to their respective north north i'm uh, sorry north south north south positions the rotor rotates so when the rotor rotates you have your prime mover so you have a rotor which moves and this can be coupled up to your transmission and the transmission can power the car so this is a very simple concept the same concept is also applied to the permanent magnet synchronous motor but the main difference is that brushless dc motor is a dc motor and this is a permanent magnet synchronous motor runs on ac switched reluctance is also the same but you can't call it either an ac or a dc it depends upon the mode of operation so now suppose you are designing an electric car which motor will you use so let's take you know a deep dive into the parameters of the dc induction motor switched reluctance pmsn and vldc now, in terms of power density, PMSM and BLDC are the most, with DC the least. Why? Because they are brushes. Brushes tend to spark and heat up, which reduces your power and also require frequent maintenance. Let's move on to efficiency. DC again has a low efficiency, and PMSM and BLDC have a higher efficiency. Controllability, how easy is it for you to control? DC has the most control. It's easy. You don't need complex motor control equipment. Induction motor gets a four. Switched reluctance gets a three. Switched reluctance motor was one of the very first motor types, you know, uh, brought into this world. And they require very complex control hardware, which is not available at the time, which is why at that point of time, Control was low, which is why there is a lower figure here. PMSM, BLDC, they require a separate control unit, just like you have an electronic control unit which controls fuel and spark in your engine. You have a separate motor controller which controls which coils are energized and which coils are de energized. Reliability DC is only three. Why brushes? Induction motor is 5, SR is 5, PMSM, BLDC take 4. Cost, DC is expensive, induction motor is the most expensive. PMSM, BLDC have 3. Noise level, DC is a 3, IM is 5, SR is, has the least noise, and PMSM and BLDC have the most noise. But most noise is your know, relative because electric vehicles don't make you know that much noise apart from that annoying whirring of the motor which is why most manufacturers have decided to give artificial noises to the electric vehicles so that the other pedestrians and other road goers know that there is an electric vehicle coming behind them i mean if you would have experienced the electric scooters they absolutely have no uh, noise and they have an instant torque curve so right from you know, zero, the torque is immense. So they go fast and there is absolutely no noise with them. So it's really dangerous. Uh, coming to maintenance, DC is a one, and PMSM and BLDC are a five. So which motors would you use based on this uh, data? What informed decision will you make? You would choose a PMSM if you have an AC application and a BLDC if you have a DC application. Now, if you ask me, do if I just keep a battery in my car and a, a motor in my car, is that enough? Can the car go? I would say no, because you need a complex battery management system which tells you your state of charge of the battery, how much battery you have, how much individual cells have 
are there any issues with the cells and whether charging is happening correctly or not coming to the motor side you need a controller a proper separate control unit which controls the motor which coil has to be energized which has to be de-energized so on and so forth suppose you have multiple coils like this you can either you can energize this positively and energize this in the negative polarity so it helps you to you know for helps you in performance it spins faster and you get a higher torque when i say spins faster at uh, it can spin only up to a maximum speed. It cannot go higher as the speed cannot be as high as the uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. The torque, yes, acceleration would be way more than uh, petrol and diesel vehicles, but it's only up to a particular point. Suppose you want to race your Tesla Model S or Model X and you want to race your you know, Lamborghini Aventador, which would eventually win. Uh, for the first half of the race, the Tesla would have smoked the Aventador. It would have gone very fast just to its sheer acceleration. And then once it reaches around 150 or no, 150 miles an hour, it would you know, continue to be in that 150 miles an hour. The Lamborghini can go all the way up to 200 or even more. So it might accelerate not as fast as the Tesla, but the speed is higher. So that speed helps out in say a drag race. So let's move on. Charging equipment. You might ask me, I have an electric car. How do I charge it? So let's go on to the types of charging. Right. You have an AC. This is very simple. You have either an AC charger or a DC charger. So. Diving deep into it, you have a level one charger, which is a 1.9 kilowatt charger. As you can see, the atrocious charge time of 16 hours. And uh, how is it connected to the electric grid? Just through a residential connection, the same power line from your house. So a little more improvement is an AC level two charger, which is a higher capacity at 2.5, 19.2 kilowatts. And it takes around two to 12 hours. This two, I feel, is a gross understatement because it's a minimum of eight to nine to 12 hours. The same thing is a residential uh, connection to the grid. Now, these are all the slow charges. You come, you come back to your house, you plug in your electric car to the grid, the whole night it charges, and the morning you might have, say, 80% or 90% of charge left just for your commute to the office, say 40 to 50 kilometers. Then you go to your office, you again charge it the whole day and it charges and you have 80 to 90 percentage. And you can use that 80 to 90 percentage to come home, again charge, again and go to office, charge. So this is a vicious circle of charging, discharging while you're driving, range anxiety and all that. So what do you do? I mean, you drive a car for one pleasure and one you know necessity so this is why just like you have you know speed petrol or extra premium petrol you have dc fast charging so what is dc fast charging it is a very high power 50 kilowatt so i'll go on to the next one also dc high power which is 350 kilowatt so in a matter of 20 to 40 minutes you can have 80 percentage of the battery charged and you can go on in your journey so this is a public station but the high power charger, like you have the Tesla superchargers, charge probably your whole battery pack in a maximum of 10 minutes. But this is directly connected to your grid. This is the only issue. So only when you have, you know, DC high power chargers, can you uh, compare your range and performance to an IC engine. Not performance, I'm sorry, range and uh, ease of use, ease of use to an IC engine. So you might have seen, you have just two, two pumps to plug, put in petrol and diesel, but then there is no standard to say you must have only this sort of, this sort of size and this sort of shape to your connectors. So there are a range of charging connectors. I'll show you the first AC connector. This 
is for North America, J1772 Type 1. Japan has a different connect or same connector. The European Union has a different connector. China has a different connector. And obviously, Tesla has a different connector. So when you come to DC fast charging, you have CCS, CHADMO, CCS2, and GBYT. CCS2 is widely used. CHADMO is also used. But if you would have heard of, say, the Nissan Leaf, which are the pioneers in EV cars, they use CCS2. And Tesla obviously has its very own single plug connector for all its vehicles, apart from the European Union. So what is the final message? AC, fast, AC charging is slow. DC charging is fast. I think with that, we've come to the end. So thank you very much for your time. We can have the question answer session. Is there anyone who would like to ask questions? If you want to, then you can please unmute yourself and ask questions. Hello. Yes, tell me. sir. Yes, uh, sir. Yes, I, I have okay. read some articles regarding electronic ve electric vehicles that uh, the battery production is equally harmful to the environment, like uh, uh, as the IC motor vehicles. Yes, correct. You will have also seen a meme saying, uh, "I put in petrol at one station, and wherever I go, I pollute the environment. And when I plug in my electric car, only the place wherein I, you know." charge my electric vehicle that pollutes and I don't pollute. I'm not sure whether you've seen that theme, but that is entirely true. So batteries as such are harmful to the environment because you have, there is a lot of mining involved. If you, there is one thing wherein you have well to wheel emissions. Uh, suppose you take an IC engine vehicle, the oil rigs dig up, refine the, uh, I mean, dig up the uh, petroleum from the ore, and that is sent to an oil refinery when fractional distillation occurs. You have petrol, diesel, plastic, Vaseline, everything from that paraffin. Uh, and then it goes on to furthermore refineries when they refine petrol and diesel from the crude oil. So finally, it comes to your a dealer and then this goes to your petrol tank of the car. So this is what is called well to wheel emission. If you uh, take an analogy to battery production. What are the rare earth materials? You have cobalt, you have neodymium, cadmium. All these are found in very remote corners of the world, like Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Chile, and a few lithium reserves, I'm not very sure, are found in China. So all this mining is a very bad process. You destroy the environment, you destroy, you have air pollution, you have all that. And uh, finally, once you get the materials, you have they have to be processed somewhere else. And ultimately, it lands in China, wherein you make the batteries. And then those batteries come back to your place. You plug it into your grid. You charge. How you produce your electricity is also equally important. If you produce your electricity through burning of coal, that also is an emission. If you produce electricity through solar or wind energy, that's fine. That is how it's supposed to be. That is how it happens in Norway and you know Scandinavian countries. So if you see the holistic approach, yes, it is difficult, which is why a long-term solution is hydrogen fuel cells, wherein the only emission you will have is water. I hope that answers your question. If it's not clear, I can repeat again. No, sir. I understood, sir. Okay. I think there are questions in the chat box also. What yes, is sir. the what is the purpose of coupler? By coupler, I think you mean the mechanical coupler for the hybrid vehicles. Sorry, the um, paddle hybrid. Mr. Venkatakrishna Sai, are you there? Okay, assuming he he or she talks about the uh, mechanical coupler. You have one shaft, right? 
you have engine, gearbox, drive shaft, wheels. So that drive shaft, if it is, uh, you know, connected to also a motor, you would have two sources to power the car. You can't put all that strain on the gearbox. You would have to put it to another device, and that device decides whether the motor drives the car or the engine drives the car. It would have a set of friction clutches and also wheel speed center, the control unit, to decide which pass horse drives the car. I hope that is clear. The next question, uh, what is the point in using electric cars? How much they could be generated from fossil fuels and nuclear power plants, but not from renewable ecosystem waste? Yes, correct. That is the main issue with electric cars. I do not like electric cars. I'm a petrol head. I own a 16-year-old design, and I don't intend on selling. And I hate EVs. Unfortunately, we have to move on to electric vehicles. The source need not be you know, a battery. It can be a hydrogen fuel cell. Hydrogen is available. You have a hydrogen fuel cell. Ultimately, what drives the car would be an electric motor. But if you have hydrogen and a hydrogen tank on board with all regulators and it's all safe, that is fine. That is not harmful to the environment. You might have a few knocks and issues, but that can be sorted out. And not in the car, be at the uh, hydrogen producing station. My opinion is to reduce pollution. Yes, you can do it with a fuel cell. And if you have any ideas for BS7, BS8 also, like Euro 7, Euro 8, that is also welcome. Was Chevrolet Bolt a failure or success for using pouch batteries? I am not sure what batteries they use now, but the Chevrolet Bolt sold in large numbers. That is one thing which has to be said. Not in India, obviously, in America. It sold in large numbers. So I feel that it was a sales success. Okay, BLDC, yes. Ah, okay, you meant the coupler, right. Okay. Any other questions, please? So we have a few other questions that we've been receiving. Uh, yes, I'll read yes, them out yes. for you. Uh, yeah. Firstly, because of the shift in the industry, what kind of skills would be expected from an engineer in order to get the best jobs or, you know, to get into these roles? Okay, uh, the audience has mechanical and electrical engineers or any other stream? Majority mechanical and electrical. I think we have students from other streams as well. Okay, great. Just, okay, I can see one civil. Okay, suppose you want to be uh, an engineer in a company. You decide what company you like, decide what stream you like, and... Uh, Depending on that, you work on it. Two major areas, scope, uh, scope of you know jobs. One is production. So probably you could do a production internship, see whether you like it, and move forward for an MTech. Or maybe even while you get a job in production, you can do a part-time MTech program in production. And also do a lot of process improvement uh, skills like uh, Lean Six Sigma, you can have uh, project management skills. See, now the problem is you can't just go into a job and expect to succeed with technical skills. You must have a mix of both. You need technical skills as well as managerial skills and a management skills. You need to have business acumen. So uh, you need a mix of both. Plus, even if you're in the technical side, suppose I feel uh, you said mechanical engineer. So suppose you're designing a car. Uh, you have to be aware of what the electrical team will also say. You have to be aware of what the marketing team will say. The marketing team will want the uh, sales team, the production. Suppose you make a car which cannot be produced, design a car which cannot be produced. It is an utter failure. Suppose you make a car which the customers don't want, then that is an utter failure. So you must be able to work in cross-functional teams. So just because you're from one stream, you can't say you must listen to whatever I do. So uh, there, there should be give and take in that area. So I feel you shouldn't look at yourselves as mechanical, electrical, automobile, blah, 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 engineers. Look at yourself as a problem solver, right? So if you're in an automobile industry, you must give a proper car, which 
the customer wants. The customer doesn't want that card, and there should be an issue. There is an issue with your uh, data collection, right? Your marketing team hasn't collected the proper data, and then you haven't worked on that data. You do something, the client wants something else. So that you know issue shouldn't happen. Plus, an up and coming field is sort of design thinking. So you must know if I design my product in such a way, what would be the impact? How would the user use it? What would be the user experience? So you shouldn't just think of, you know, my job is to design this. I will design this. I will not care about anything else. You shouldn't, shouldn't do that. You must see what would be the effect of this for the final product. If I design it this way, what would be the effect? If I design it the other way, what would be the effect? You must take feedback from your other teams, and then uh, you really should have a holistic approach. This is what I want to say. And one skill will definitely not help you. Since we are in our, you know, I say 20s, we uh, have to keep learning. Life is a learning process. We cannot stop learning. We cannot stop with B Tech or M Tech or PhD. That's not enough. Keep learning always. It need not be, say, from a, a IIT or an IAM. You know? Your part-time courses can be from any college, from a course which you like, which is relevant for your job, like, say, a Six Sigma or a project management course. So this is not limited to even engineers. It can be done in any walk of life. It is basically continuous improvement. So if anybody wants a you know, case-by-case case uh, study saying I am a production engineer or I am a design engineer. What do I do? You want me to help you? I can help you out offline as well. No use. But this is what I wanted to say. You need technical as well as business knowledge. Uh, be empathetic of all the other people who are working in your same project. See how the user would use your project and work in that fashion. Uh, sure, sir. Since you were talking about learning, uh, we have a question regarding that as well. Uh, right. Which countries are at the forefront of making electric and hybrid cars, and which countries would be best to pursue further studies if students want to go for masters or uh, you know get get good jobs and and work at the forefront in, in these technologies? Right. So one thing which the pandemic has taught us is that we need not be at the place yeah. where yeah. the uh, you know, production happens. Uh, Tesla is a giant in America. Tesla is setting up shop in India as well. Uh, another thing would be um, there was another country. I, I think Apple. Apple had a research, or Apple are going to put on a resource center in India. I think it's in Hyderabad. I'm not very sure. I think it's in Hyderabad. Or I think it was Microsoft. One of these two giants. So the place where you go doesn't matter. The company where you work for matters. Suppose you want to go to you know, an electric vehicle industry, for a pure electric vehicle industry. I would say Tesla. Tesla, GM's General Motors uh, EV division. I think Bangalore, there is a General Motors GM TCI, which works on you know, R&D, especially for EV markets. Uh, plus another thing, Norway and Scandinavia are where EV is thrive, but that doesn't mean that any you know R and D happens there. R and D can happen even at you know India. You know Tesla working in India, we can be making Tesla EVs for the Norwegian people. So suppose. Uh, one second, instead of working for Tesla or the bank, yeah, sure, you can make your own brand. You know, you might have heard of Praveg Extension. They are an Indian company making an electric car. And the market they've, they've uh, uh, shelved out is very specific to taxi operators. That can even be, you know, a helpful data gathering solution. They can improve their uh, uh, products using the data gathered by the fleet operators. And coming back to masters, I feel getting into a job is more important first. I mean, this is my this is my honest opinion. Uh, 
this, this is what I did. After I finished my B.Tech, I was searching out for a job. Three months, so I was searching for a job. And ultimately, I landed at this as an auto. Uh, I, I was honored for them to take me in. And now I'm doing my postgraduate. So I feel the first thing which you should do after your B.Tech would be try to get a job somewhere wherein you feel happy. Get a year or two of work experience, then move on to your MTech or your MBA. Suppose you want to say, no, I don't want to work for one or two years. I want to go straight to MTech. Please be sure that that is a reputed college for MTech. I mean, if you want to work in EV, it's fine. You need not go searching for an MTech electric vehicles course. You can do something which is as far-fetched as MTech design engineering at a proper college wherein there is a history of, say, your favorite brand uh, recruiting from there. Suppose Tesla recruits from KTH Royal University of Sweden. You finish your master's there and you can work for somebody else before going to Tesla. All you have to do is establish a name for yourself. They should say either say uh, Arpita or Pranav or Pratik has done these projects. They are useful. They are revolutionary projects and I would like for them to work in my company. So after you go into that company and go into those projects, you can be contacted by your dream company, say suppose Tesla, and then you can work for Tesla. You need not start at Tesla. You can eventually finish at Tesla or work in Tesla and as I don't know what his name is or her name is. Some person said you can make your own brand. Sure, sir. And uh, there is this one question where um, there's a lot of stigma about electric vehicles. And a lot of people say that electric vehicles mark the end of the mechanical automobile industry. Is this true? And if it's not, then what kind of roles will a mechanical engineer be expected to perform? Yeah, that is not at all going to happen, especially in India, where we still struggle to get a full day of electricity in our house, right? So when we struggle to get a full day of electricity in our house, we can't use any sort of surplus electricity to power our electric cars. So India for, say, another 10, 15, not 10, sorry, other 20 years would definitely still have IC engine vehicles. You might see Euro 7, Euro 8, BS 7, BS 8. Then, but one thing is sure, we will also have to some extent of electrification. Like I said, micro, mild hybrids. You cannot see every single car which you see an electric way, as an electric vehicle, right? Plus, the people who make the batteries and the motors people who are interested in drivetrain or gearbox can go into the motor side, right? So you can go on to the motors. People interested in the engines can again move on to the motors. Plus brakes, suspension, tires, wheels, body, all this will not change irrespective of what, you know, power source parts the car, correct? Plus how do you produce the car? Suppose you have some revolutionary antimatter stuff which pass the car, you would still need a production team. You would still need a design team to design those products, uh, those robots which make your car. So it will not change. You will not have, you know, mechanical engineers, automobile engineers, electrical engineers being made obsolete because of the advent of electric cars. You would still need them to you know, be at the forefront of design and innovation. I um, hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. And uh, on what parameters do we choose an electric vehicle? Say, I want to buy an electric vehicle. So mostly for regular automobiles, we, we see power, torque, mileage, number of cylinders, the weight, etc. But how does it change if we're using an electric vehicle? Right. So ultimately, you start off with your budget. So the budget for, say, a four-wheeler starts at 20 lakhs because there is no car made in India, which is lesser than 20 lakhs. Mahindra E2 has been discontinued. Uh, what else below the EV? I think that's about it. The Nexon EV is where you start, right? The Nexon EV is where you start. Um, you could have a huge battery. You could have a huge motor. All that is fine. You could see acceleration times. 
you can see a range. The most important factor why choosing an electric car to buy would be range. Because range on one single charge is what we Indians expect. We don't have the luxury of having three, four cars in our garage. We have one car and we use it for our office commute, college commute. We use it to take our family out for the weekend and for, you know, uh, you know, a solo drive. So you can't have one car for the commute, one car for the weekend, one car for shopping, one car for this, one car for that. So the uh, car which you choose should have a good range. The uh, range should be high. It should be at least above, say, 300 kilometers. So you can charge every other day rather than charging every day. So it takes care of your commute and probably some other shopping you have in the evening. Acceleration. All One thing you need not worry about electric vehicles. You press the accelerator or the throttle if there is no throttle. Body. You press the so-called accelerator and it just goes. Right from the moment you press, you get an instant torque. Like our engines, our IC engines develop torque only at around 5,000 RPM. I'm talking about petrol engines. So you need not rev the motor so much. So you rev it, say, to around uh, 1,500 RPM. It goes with max torque. So you would be the fastest car out there. Even if you have a Lambo, you would be the fastest car. You would beat the Lambo in acceleration. But the range is the key thing which you have to see. Because ultimately, there are too many things to see. You might say, I have a 2-liter, 2,000cc engine. I have a four-cylinder engine. I know how my car behaves. You will not know how your electric vehicle behaves. So depending on the just, just how humans are moody, you know, uh, electric vehicles are also moody. You know, if it's very hot or if it's very cold, if it's raining, the battery range will just drop. The performance will reduce. All that will happen. So the only thing you can see is the range. The car will be fast. And you can't compare ride and handling. You can compare ride and handling to your IC engine counterpart. Suppose you have a Nexon. Again, I'm sorry. I have to take the Nexon. There's no other proper example. So the Nexon, you know how an IC engine Nexon feels. So the same feeling you would get in an EV, albeit with a heavier feeling, because there's a lot of batteries. Plus, there is a proper weight distribution. So your handling probably will be that much better. This is, this is you know, uh, oh, yeah, one more thing. You can also see the charging. You will, always, you will always get a standard slow AC charger while you buy the car. And uh, unfortunately, we cannot, as individuals, we cannot install DC fast chargers for, the, for ourselves. So you see whether you live next to a DC fast charger or unfortunately, you'll have to use the AC power from your house. So that's about it. Range, charger, uh, range and charger is the only thing you can see. Uh, sure, sir. Uh, we have one question in the chat box. Does high speed really matter for ordinary audience? Um, okay. Uh, you might have heard about this Okinawa Praise. It's a small scooter, right? It's an electric scooter. The maximum speed would be around 80 kmph. I'm not very sure whether they've introduced a variant higher, but this is the highest which I have seen. I have not experienced, but I've seen 80 kmph. So this 80 kmph is considered a high-speed EV. So you might say 80 kmph is nothing, but for the EV side, EV scooter side, 80 is a high speed. Uh, 20. There are certain scooters or you know electric mopeds again launched by Okinawa and a few more uh, manufacturers like Hero Electric. Their maximum speed would be around 30 to 40. They are called low speed. And around 60 would be medium speed. Based on your speed and the amount of battery that you have, you are eligible for a tax cut. Right? So based on the speeds, you would be uh, paying only, say, 20% of the road tax as compared to a traditional IC engine vehicle. Uh, coming back to the cars, uh, the speed is just... You know, a consequence of having a high uh, performance motor and battery pack. 
you know, you can always travel at 50 and get extend your range. Or if you want to travel, like the IC engine cars for a pleasure drive, drive at 80, reduce the battery, go to a charging station, increase the battery percentage, carry on. So this high speed is not uh, something which you make the car for. It's just a consequence of having a high performance motor and batteries. The main thing you are for is range. Yes, sir. And do we have anyone else from the audience who would like to ask any questions? Hello, sir. Uh, I would like to ask a question. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the, like, uh, what, what do you think of the battery swapping tech, uh, future in India? Like, given all the depreciation and life, life of the battery, is it even like sensible for third right. parties to? Come and what do you say? Invest in that uh, swapping infrastructure. Um, right. Uh, one segment of vehicles which has really, uh, you know, accepted the EV change is three wheelers. You might find a lot of, you know, uh, three wheelers running on electric. Plus, Sun Mobility has installed a battery swapping station. I think in Karnataka, uh, wherein you don't own the battery. You somebody else owns the battery, obviously some mobility. You take the battery from your old EV discharged battery, uh, put it into the charging station, take a new battery, put it back. Then you might be paying a small rental fee. That's all. Uh, so battery swapping does make sense, but you can't expect, say, a Mercedes, a Tata, an MG to have the same sort of battery size and specification, right? So suppose you standardize the battery, then fine. So one particular person can supply the same battery to a uh, Mercedes EQC, an MG, not like the MG ZS, and a Tata Nexon, and probably a three-wheeler also. So the same battery can be used in all these. But the same battery quality which you find in a Mercedes will not be in a three-wheeler. So standardization is a big problem. So unless things are standardized, suppose you take a Mahindra Trio electric vehicle and an Ampere electric vehicle, there itself, even though they are three wheelers and they have the same size and shape, there itself you will have a difference in voltage, in capacity, in uh, the number of cells and also design of cells. So their standardization is very difficult. But then Sun Mobility have done it with, I think, Omega Seiki. Omega Seiki is one sort of uh, three-wheeler manufacturer. So their batteries alone, you can swap with Sun Mobility. Similarly, somebody else can do it for Mahindra. Somebody else can do it for uh, maybe Tesla. Somebody else can do it for Mercedes. So if you have these particular persons doing it for that particular brand, yes, it does make sense. But then... Uh, you might have heard about Ashok Leyland and the Circuit S, which is a swappable solution. But obviously, you can't by yourself as a single person swap out a huge battery for a bus. So you have to take it to a station, uh, put it on a jack. You'll have people removing it, putting in a new battery, taking it out. So this is going to take 30 minutes. So it's not as easy as a three-wheeler. But it does exist. But unless it is standardized, you can't uh, you know, make it a success. Sir, um, I'm Shashank here. Ah, Shashank, tell me. Yeah, so we have a lot of uh, new advanced cars. Like we have a car that, that is flying in the air now. Sweden, I guess, is a country that allowed a flying car in the market. Yes, yes. We have cars that are going around uh, 500 kilometers per hour. We have cars that go in water as well as on land. So my, like, and oh. none of this is possible with the present electrical technology we have. It, it's a oh. huge way around. So my question is, as humanity on the whole, should we be focusing more on more efficient and environmentally friendly cars and less on this new advanced technologies or taking environment as consideration? Should we uh, stop this high development, that ultra real development we are having right now? Well, you have people like people like Bugatti who have, you know, a history of making the fastest cars in the world. So they will continue to make the fastest cars in the world. May not be fully EV. But you might have people like the Koenigsegg with the Jesco as in a hybrid with a small three-cylinder petrol engine 
plus, which is running on biofuel, plus, you know, an electric motor. That helps the environment as well as, you know, uh, is that a pinnacle of innovation and all that. So you need not just focus, one person need not focus only on one thing. You have probably me focusing on something, you're focusing on something else, the other person on something else. So if I focus on environment, you focus on innovation, other, other person focuses on, say, the pleasure of driving and such. So we've made three individual, uh, you know, solutions for three problems. And every person in that some point of their lives would want pleasure, would want to be driving the most innovative and powerful machine on the planet. And they would ultimately want to, you know, save the environment. So I feel a three pronged approach of how, how, how many of our pronged approach is most, is better. Anybody else would like to ask? Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes, sir. Do you think the addition of manual transmission into electric vehicles would improve their efficiency more than it is? Uh, it would uh, 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 obviously have an effect on uh, the torque that uh, EVs are primarily known for. Uh, because it works for uh, the, the analogous IC engines. So do you right. think... Uh, yeah, so I, I can see from where you're getting the idea. There was a, recently a Swift, a person with a Swift desire who had converted his IC, his or her IC engine, to uh, electric. And the same gearbox was coupled. Plus, you would have also seen a Mustang, which is known for its muscle car heritage, with uh, an electric motor, but with still the gearbox intact. So obviously, the, the manual gearbox cannot withstand so much torque being uh, applied to the wheels. I mean, it's better to just let the computers take control and uh, let them take care of torque with the torque vectoring and so on. So saying which how much torque goes to one wheel, how much torque goes to the other wheel, and so on. So, so I feel it's best to let the computer take control. We just have to sit back, use the brake, and use the throttle. It is not one of my, you know, uh, what do you call it? things which I advocate. You know, manual transmission and uh, motor does not, you know, gel well. How do we have any, any other questions? Okay, so I think we're done with the question, sir. Uh, we have a small vote of thanks now. Great, yes. Uh, Mr. Nishant Govind Rajan, sir, it has been a pleasure having you here. For the participants and viewers here, I'd like to bring it to your notice that Mr. Nishant was not in the pink of his health just a week before from now. <laughs> and still he managed to bring out one of the most engaging and, you know, this was one of the best sessions we've had and it, it was an awesome presentation, sir. So, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for uh, accepting. Next, uh, Dr. V. Uma Maheshwar, sir, you're a constant source of inspiration and support to us. We'll be thankful to you forever. And thank you again for uh, being there for this event. And uh, thank you for making this a reality. And next, all the participants and viewers who, who are here uh, for the webinar today, I hope you had a great session today and um, maybe you learned something really new today and thank you for being here. Thank you very much for this great opportunity. Thank you. It was a real honor and pleasure for me to present in front of all of you. Thank you. And um, we'll be putting out a form in the chat box right now. To all the participants, we request you to fill that form so that you get your participation certificates. Uh, it's right there in the chat box. We've put it already. And uh, from Uma Maheshwar sir's side, I think he has some problem with the uh, network. Uh, he specifically told me to thank you, sir, for coming here on such a, such a short notice of time and giving us so much uh, knowledge about something that is so trending. We will never find this kind of thing anywhere. Even if we search, we won't even understand the terminology that uh, you know we read so thank you so much about you know for coming down and, and having this webinar with us thank you thank you it's, it's my honor. thank you very much thank you sir um okay so if all of you have uh, filled out the google form then we'll close the session in five minutes if you've
fill the form then you can do so thank you one and all hope to meet you in the future for our collaborations sure sir. thank you we'll be looking forward to that please definitely fill the google form before you leave the form will not be released again uh, if you need the certificates you have to fill the form before leaving the session thank you we've also put in our instagram uh, id in the chat box for those of you who have not uh, known about the instagram you can go there visit and you can follow us there for more updates about such events ఓకే అందరం మనం కూడా లీవ్ అయిదాం అయిపోయింది ఈవెంట్